Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Federal Society virtual event. My name is Marco J. Lloyd, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups for the Federalist Society. Today, we're so excited to host a litigation update on Childs v. Salazar, featuring Cody Barnett. Mr. Barnett is a legal counsel on Alliance Defending Freedom's appellate advo advocacy team. Before joining ADF, he served as the William H. Rehnquist Fellow at Cooper & Kirk and has clerked for several judges in the U.S. Court of Appeals. He earned his JD from the University of Kentucky College of Law, where he served as president of the Christian Legal Society and as an articles editor for the Kentucky Law Journal. Our moderator today is Tessa Schur. Ms. Schur is committee staff in the U.S. House of Representatives. Before joining the House, she served as litigation associate at the Fairness Center. A graduate of Penn State Dickinson Law, Ms. Schur has also worked at the U.S. Department of Justice's Office of Legal Policy U.S. Department of Defense, and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. If you'd like to learn more about today's speakers, their full bios can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. Finally, I'll note that, as always, the Federal Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues, and all expressions of opinion are those of the speakers. With that, Ms. Schur, thank you for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco, and the Federalist Society for hosting us today. Welcome all, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this discussion of Charles v. Salazar. I am pleased to moderate today's program in my personal capacity, so any remarks or opinions that I state today are mine only, not the House of Representatives or any members of Congress. So that said, for today's program, we have a question and answer feature on Zoom that we encourage you to use. We would love to see questions come in from you folks. So as you think of questions, please send them along. No need to wait until the end to send them in. And then Cody and I will turn to them during the final portion of today's program. So now I will go ahead and turn it over to our presenter, Mr. Cody Barnett, to tell us about this very important case. Oh, thank you, Tessa, and thank you again to the Federalist Society for having me today. It's a delight to be able to talk about this case and talk about the contours of what is at stake here. And I want to do that, I think, by walking through just a couple of different table setting uh, issues. And in order to understand this case, I think it's important to talk about, number one, who is Kaylee Childs? Number two, what is Colorado's law and how does it affect her? And number three, what is the legal backdrop against which this law is evaluated? And so first, who is Kaylee Childs? So Kaylee Childs is a licensed professional counselor in Colorado. She started off her career working with people um, who dealt with issues of trauma, um, but now serves a variety of clients with uh, a wide array of mental health needs including personality disorders, eating disorders, addictions, gender dysphoria, and sexual attractions. Ms. Childs is also a practicing Christian and her faith informs her worldview. Um, it also informs the worldview of many of her clients. In fact, many of these clients seek her out specifically because they share the same worldview as her and want to receive counseling that is consistent with that worldview. Uh, Ms. Childs does not impose her faith or her views on anyone. If a client comes to her, with a different worldview, the client is the one who is setting the goals and Ms. Childs is helping that client to achieve that. But in many cases, clients come sharing that Christian background and that Christian worldview, and they wanna grow comfortable with their bodies and whatever it is they're struggling with uh, in light of their faith and bring things in line with their faith convictions. And Ms. Childs wants to help them to do that. Uh, but that brings us to the second issue of Colorado's law prevents her from doing that in certain contexts. So a few years ago, Colorado enacted this law, which is a restriction on the type of counseling conversations that Ms. Childs can have with her minor clients. Um, and specifically, the law forbids any attempt uh, or proportion to change an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity, and it includes any efforts to change behaviors, gender expressions, any efforts to eliminate or reduce sexual or romantic attractions or feelings toward individuals of the same sex. The law has an exemption um, for any counseling that provides acceptance, support, or understanding for the facilitation of an individual's coping, social support, and identity exploration or development, 
as long as that counseling does not seek to change sexual orientation or gender identity. And the law doesn't define any of these terms uh, further than that. It sort of leaves it to the counselor to risk that any effort that might purportedly change or um, differentiate a client's unwanted behaviors will run afoul of this law. About 25 uh, states have similar laws, uh, but this is not the first challenge to such a law. Um, these laws have been challenged dating back to the early 2010s. California was one of the first states to enact such a law, and it was challenged in the Ninth Circuit in a case called Pickup v. Brown. Uh, in that case, the challengers, a licensed professional counselor, uh, brought a First Amendment claim both under the Free Speech and Free Exercise Clause. And the panel there held that professionals sort of have a continuum on which their speech exists. On one end of the spectrum, a professional, when he or she is engaging in public dialogue, has all the rights that the Free Speech Clause gives to any other citizen, um, the strongest protections possible. On the other end of the spectrum, the Ninth Circuit said was when a professional engages in conduct, again, just like anybody else, um, conduct that is not expressive conduct doesn't receive any protection by the First Amendment. And then the Ninth Circuit said there's a middle part of the spectrum, which is when a professional engages in speech as part of their professional capacity, that receives um, some protection, but not the full-throated protection that public dialogue receives. And it proceeded to evaluate California's law under that spectrum and said that these type of prohibitions on counseling are conduct. So the farthest end of the spectrum, no First Amendment protection. Uh, the Ninth Circuit refused to hear the case on banc over the dissent of Judge O'Scanlan, who said that really um, what is at issue in these cases is speech, not conduct. And he looked at a few Supreme Court precedents to support that. Uh, more on that later. Uh, there was another challenge to uh, a nearly identical law in New Jersey around this time period, uh, King versus Governor of New Jersey. And the Third Circuit uh, did something a little bit differently. It uh, embraced the sp spectrum that the Ninth Circuit created, but it refused to treat counseling conversations as conduct. It said that that was nothing more than a labeling game that what was at issue here were words and words were speech. And so it was going to treat it as speech, but it treated it as speech in the middle of that spectrum. So it got some constitutional protection, but not the full panoply of protection that public dialogue would get. And then a few years later, the US Supreme Court took up a case, uh, Nifla v. Becerra. And that case was not about these counseling laws. It involved uh, a lot of California that would have required pregnancy crisis centers to post notices that pointed any of their clients toward the state's um, uh, abortion facilities. And the pregnancy crisis center sued and said, this is you know, compelled speech, this is a violation of our speech rights. And funny enough, California relied on this spectrum that Pickup had created to say, no, 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 this is conduct or at best professional speech. Uh, it does not receive first full amendment protection. And the US Supreme Court took that case and said, there is no such thing as a spectrum. There is no such thing as a professional speech doctrine that you have speech and you have conduct. And just because speech is uttered by a professional does not mean that it is unprotected. And so after NIFLA is decided, then you get another challenge to one of these counseling restrictions. Uh, this time it was a local ordinance and not a state law. In the 11th Circuit, you had Otto versus City of Boca Raton. Uh, and the 11th Circuit post NIFLA said, you know, just like the Third Circuit, we think that these conversations are speech. So what this law is regulating is speech as applied to these therapists. And so we're going to give it the full range of free speech protections and ended up striking down uh, those local ordinances after giving it First Amendment scrutiny. Then you had a challenge just a few years ago, uh, again, in the Ninth Circuit, uh, the state of Washington enacted one of these laws, Tingley v. Ferguson, and the Ninth Circuit split with the Eleventh Circuit and sort of went back to the analysis that Pickup did. You know, it said that counseling is actually conduct and conduct does not receive any protection under the First Amendment. And so therefore this law is valid. Uh, again, the Ninth Circuit did not take up the case on banc, um, but over a couple of dissentals, one again from Judge O'Scanlan, who issued a statement joined by several active judges on the court, 
and another by Judge Bumate. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court did not take that case up on a petition for certiorari, uh, but Justice Kavanaugh indicated that he would have accepted the case, and Justices Thomas and Alito also dissented from that denial. And so that then brings us to the case at hand, Charles v. Salazar, uh, Ms. Child's challenge, Colorado's prohibition on counseling, and the district court said, you know, we agree with, I agree with the Ninth Circuit, this is conduct and not speech, therefore no First Amendment protection, and on appeal, the Ninth Circuit, or the Tenth Circuit, excuse me, uh, did the exact same thing and said that this law regulates conduct and not speech. So that's the legal uh, backdrop against which Charles B. Salazar has been litigated. And I think there are sort of three threshold speech questions, and then there's the alternative free exercise question. And so just to walk through each of them uh, to set the table for our discussion today. So I think the most important question is already hinted at is what exactly are these laws regulating? Are they regulating speech or are they regulating conduct? Because really how you answer that question will then sort of chart the path for the next two questions under the First Amendment. And as of now, the, the Tenth Circuit has entrenched a split amongst the circuits on whether conversations in the counseling room are considered speech or conduct. So the Eleventh and the Third Circuits have said that conversations are speech, words are speech, that if a sophomore psychology student were having this conversation with her friends in her dorm room, it would look no different than the exact type of conversations a licensed counselor is having in that counseling room. And if we were to take the Supreme Court seriously in NIFLA, that speech doesn't lose its protection just because a professional says it, then we have to treat these conversations as speech. And they were really drawing on a long line of Supreme Court cases that have looked at laws that generally regulate conduct, but as applied to particular plaintiffs, actually regulate speech or expression. And so to, to name two of those that the 11th and Third Circuit looked at that were also at issue in Childs, you know, one dating back to the 1970s, Cohen v. California, taking us back to our days in law school and con law. This was a case where a citizen wore a jacket with some expletives on it. He was cited for disturbing the peace. And the U.S. Supreme Court said that even though disturbance of the peace generally is aimed at conduct, that what it was really targeting in that particular case was expression. It wasn't the wearing of the jacket conduct that was the problem. It was the words. It was the communicating of the message on that jacket. And so applying a disturbance of the peace statute to that jacket was actually applying it to speech. And so therefore it had to be afforded the same First Amendment protections because it was not targeting conduct, but speech. Fast forward about uh, 15 years ago, Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. Congress enacted a law that forbade giving material support to certain terrorist organizations. You had some lawyers and other professionals who wanted to give advice to groups that were designated terrorist groups. The United States government said that this violated the statute. It was material support. Uh, and the case, again, is giving material support in that instance conduct or is it speech? Generally speaking, giving material support would be conduct. But because what the lawyers and professional groups wanted to do was give advice and give counseling, that was speech. And so uh, Chief Justice Roberts, in the majority opinion, said that the only thing the statute was targeting in that instance was the communication of a message. And when a statute as applied targets the communication of a message, even if it regulates conduct in 99% of the time, in that 1% of, of time that it's being applied to the communication of a message, it's targeting speech and triggers First Amendment scrutiny. And so that's the line of cases that the 11th Circuit and the 3rd Circuit used when they concluded that counseling conversations were speech and not conduct. They, they followed the, the Cohen holder line to say, these are words, we protect words as the communication of an idea. That's all the statute is targeting in these instances, in these cases brought by the counselor. Therefore, we're going to subject these laws to First Amendment scrutiny. By contrast, the Ninth and Tenth Circuit said, you know, these laws prohibit what goes on in the counseling. Counseling is a profession. It is 
considered a medical profession. These type of conversations are considered a treatment. Treatments are generally conduct. And so therefore what these laws are doing are regulating conduct, not speech. Um, to the extent these laws regulate speech, uh, the Ninth and Tenth Circuit said, it does so only incidentally. Uh, it does not target speech at its core. And for support for that proposition, it looked at uh, the 1992 case, KCV Planned Parenthood. So one of the challenges in Casey was to the informed consent laws um, that required doctors to obtain consent before performing an abortion. And so the Ninth and Tenth Circuit said, Look, in that case, the informed consent laws were upheld as part of the regulation of medicine. It absolutely implicates speech, but only does so at the margin. These counseling conversation restrictions are no different from there. And so therefore, these are regulations of conduct that at best uh, sweep in speech only incidentally. And so you have a fairly entrenched two to two circuit split on what are counseling conversations? Are they speech or are they conduct? And so the, the second two questions, um, one of them is only implicated on one side of the split. So saying that something is speech doesn't answer the constitutional question. We don't end the analysis there. We then ask if something is speech, how is this law regulating speech? Some laws can regulate speech in a very neutral way and therefore courts take a lighter touch, but some can do so in a very non-neutral way and therefore get higher degrees of scrutiny. And so the two ways generally that laws can regulate speech uh, high handedly that kind of requires more judicial scrutiny are what we call content based and viewpoint based. Content based is when uh, a law regulates speech based on what it says. And the Supreme Court has said the way that we can tell that a law is content based is if an enforcement official has to look at what the speaker is saying to decide whether or not the law is violated. Similarly, viewpoint-based is just a worse form of content-based speech. It's not only censoring speech or you know, prohibiting speech or punishing speech based on its content, but it's doing so based on a specific viewpoint and a matter of debate. And if laws uh, are content or viewpoint-based, again, they get a higher degree of judicial scrutiny. So the 11th and 3rd Circuit, um, because they viewed these counseling restrictions as regulations of speech, uh, then had to decide, well, how do these laws regulate speech? Again, the Third Circuit, um, after pickup, said, well, it's regulating speech in a professional context, and that means it gets less judicial scrutiny. And the Supreme Court in NIFLA expressly abrogated that doctrine. In fact, it cited pickup and the Third Circuit's case King by name for disapproval. Uh, so the Third Circuit's analysis is a dead letter on this issue, but the Eleventh Circuit said these counseling restrictions are both content-based because they only apply to certain speakers talking about certain subjects, namely sexual orientation or gender identity, and they also said that they're viewpoint-based. Um, in fact, that's baked into the heart of this law and its exception. If you are pro-change, then your speech is restricted. If you are against change, then your speech is allowed. And the 11th Circuit said that that is classic viewpoint discrimination. And so that is the, the second uh, question, um, but only if you conclude that these laws target speech. And so then the third question becomes, they implicate speech, they implicate conduct. How much is the judiciary going to look under the hood? You know, What kind of deference are they going to give to the legislature? or what kind of scrutiny are they gonna require these laws to meet? Um, again, starting with the 11th Circuit, you know, if these laws regulate speech and if they do so in a content and viewpoint based manner, then they have to satisfy what we call strict scrutiny. And strict scrutiny really requires the government to do two things. Uh, first, the government has to show that it has a compelling interest in regulating speech, that the reason that it is doing so is of the highest order. Uh, and not only that, but the Supreme Court said that that interest has to be compelling vis-a-vis -vis the particular plaintiff, that it's not just some abstract level of interest, but it is an interest that is compelling as to the particular speaker in question. And the second thing the government has to show is there's really no other way to achieve that interest but for the speech regulation at issue. It's very rare for the government to win when uh, strict scrutiny is enacted. Um, you know, we, there's a joke amongst constitutional litigators that 
it, that strict scrutiny is basically fatal for the government. And so you can see and understand why the government tries to argue that strict scrutiny does not apply, um, that these laws either are targeting conduct, um, because as we'll get to, that does not get strict scrutiny, or they're targeting speech in a neutral way that only gets a lesser form of scrutiny. Um, and so that brings then to what the Ninth and Tenth Circuit did, because they concluded that these laws target conduct and not speech, they subjected it to rational basis. Um, and rational basis review just means that if there is any rational reason for the legislature to have enacted this law, it will be upheld against a constitutional challenge. And the legislature didn't even have to invoke that rational reason. If the judges themselves can think of a rational reason, that generally will suffice. So it's sort of the opposite of strict scrutiny. The government generally tends to win under rational basis. And that's exactly what the Tenth Circuit held in this case. It held that Ms. Childs' conversations or conduct, that the uh, state had a rational reason to prohibit what it sees and views as ineffective counseling. And so therefore, Ms. Childs' First Amendment challenge had to fail. And so I think that frames what is at the heart of these cases, which is the free speech challenge. There is an alternative challenge that has been raised in these cases, which I've alluded to a little bit, which is a free exercise. So the First Amendment protects not only the freedom of speech, but also the free exercise of religion. And I think it's important to note that these counseling restrictions target overwhelmingly counsel provided by and sought by religious folks. Uh, it's generally counseling that people with deep religious convictions, generally in the Abrahamic faith, are, are trying to bring certain parts of themselves in line with those convictions. So they want to grow comfortable with the body that they think that their God has given them. They want to grow comfortable with the tenets of their religious faith, and they see certain sexual attractions, sexual behaviors as intention with those tenets. And rather than elevate those attractions and behaviors above their religion, they would like to bring them in harmony with it. And so they want to seek out a counselor who shares that worldview and who will help them be able to achieve that harmony. Um, and so these laws fall very disproportionately on people of faith um, in the sense that it prevents uh, counselors of faith and counselees of faith from getting the type of counseling that, that they want to receive in accordance with that. And so in pickup, there was a free exercise challenge brought. The Ninth Circuit rejected it and said that, you know, anyone can get this kind of counseling. It's not targeted at religion. Tingley also brought this in the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit again doubled down on what it said in pickup. And Ms. Childs also brought a free exercise challenge as well. Um, and Really, the crux of the free exercise challenge looks at a case from the 1990s out of the Supreme Court called uh, Church of Lukumi Babalu I versus City of Hialeah. And so that was a case where a local town had enacted an ordinance that prohibited sacrificing animals, basically aimed at a local religion that involved animal sacrifice as part of its rights. And the town said, you know, we have an interest in you know, protecting these animals in hygiene. But the problem was that this town had basically enacted so many exemptions from its laws that the only people that the law applied to in its real operation was the particular religion at issue. And the Supreme Court said that that was um, a violation of the free exercise clause, that a law's real operation is strong evidence of what it is targeting, that even if on its face, it says nothing about religion, if in its practice, it's actually following disproportionately on religion, it is just as if the law were to say religion on its face. And so that is the, that was the crux of the argument that Ms. Charles brought. But again, the Tenth Circuit rejected that and says that the object of this law is counseling, and this counseling can be um, given and received by people not of faith. And so therefore, it did not uh, actually target religion, um, but instead targeted a therapeutic um, a therapeutic method. And so I think that kind of frames uh, the, the main issues in that case. And so I think now we're going to talk about sort of some deeper dives now that the table is set. Yeah, thank you, Cody, for that wonderful introduction to this issue. While we're waiting for questions to start coming in, which again, I'll take the opportunity to encourage you all to send us questions either through the chat or the Q&A feature. 
We'd love to engage with what you're thinking and what you want to know from our expert here. But while we're waiting for those to come in, I, I think it's worth diving into this issue of conduct versus speech a little bit deeper. So the, because that's one of the main issues here. So the Tenth Circuit, in its opinion, explicitly says that the statute does not regulate expression. It's the practice of conversion therapy, not the discussion of this particular subject by the mental health services provider that's prohibited. So the, the court then goes on to say and explain that any speech that's impacted by this statute is merely incidental to the conduct that it's regulating. So I, my question for you, Cody, and I think we'd all be interested in hearing is, well, it kind of sounds like the court is, the statute is telling mental health providers what they can and can't say. But the court here seems to be slapping a label on the speech, calling it a, a type of therapy. So with that reasoning, couldn't almost anything be considered conduct? And where do we draw the line? I think that's exactly right, Tessa. And I think it's one of the major and dangerous implications of the Tenth Circuit's reasoning here. In fact, the Eleventh Circuit took on that point directly uh, when the local municipalities were defending their counseling restrictions as conduct and not speech. And the Tenth Circuit said, if you were to just slap a label on this, what couldn't you slap a label on? You could say that the content of, of teaching uh, what words a teacher uses is just the practice of teaching. Uh, same for debating, same for book clubs. And, and, and so it really, um, it, it sort of boggles the mind, this idea that just because we can give something a label uh, that is on its surface conduct, that means we don't have to dig beneath what that label says to what the law is actually targeting. You know, And as for treatment, I thought Judge Hartz in his dissent did a really good job of saying the word treatment doesn't have any purchase in the First Amendment. There's no exception in the First Amendment that says, well, if you can call something a treatment, it's actually conduct and not speech. And so I think the way that we draw the line is how the Supreme Court has always drawn the line, which is what is actually being targeted by the statute. In this case, it was words, it was conversations that if you were to take it out of its professional context and plop it down anywhere, we would have no questions saying that this is speech. Um, and the Tenth Circuit tried to elide that difference by saying, no, 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 we're not looking at the professional context. Um, we're looking at what the law is actually targeting. But inevitably, anytime it was responding to these objections, it defaulted back to, well, Ms. Childs has a license. Well, she is trained and the psychology student isn't trained. And so it, it really is doing exactly what NIFLA said not to do, which is allowing the state to put a label on something and thereby regulate a professional's speech. And I can certainly understand the value to regulating professionals and the types of services that they're providing or um, treatments. Uh, there's a reason that the, the, the legal profession is so highly regulated and the practice of medicine. These are very high stakes professions with real people and real life problems involved. So I, I can see the value to the regulation there. But where where is the balance between the court telling someone what they can and can't say and regulating a profession? And so where do you find the balance between pro protecting an individual's First Amendment rights, but also making sure that that profession is is administered in the proper way? I think it's a great question because I think what gets lost in the noise of these cases is this idea that if we say that counseling is speech, it becomes the Wild West, that anything goes, that there will be this parade of horribles that happens. And I, I think it's important to note up front that calling something speech isn't the end of the analysis. You know, as I sort of walk through in our table setting, there are still two more questions that have to be asked. Um, and so I think the, the first thing that we are asking for in this case is simply to treat speech as what it is, which is speech, 
require the state to prove that it's either regulating speech neutrally, in which case it gets less judicial scrutiny, or if it's not doing it neutrally, that it really does have a compelling interest. And there's no other way to achieve that interest but for. And so I think the system is already designed to handle a professional's actual speech being regulated. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, at the end of the day, uh, there's no challenges to malpractice suits. You know, malpractice suits have been one of the greatest ways that the state has kept uh, a professional's truly dangerous speech in check because it's one tailored to the individual rather than a broad prophylactic rule that prevents speech on the front end. And two, there is evidence of an actual harm and an actual standard of care that which that harm is judged against. So I think there are plenty of tools that are already available um, in the system that we don't need these broad prophylactic uh, prohibitions on speech on the front end. Uh, and, and in fact, if you look at the case that the Tenth Circuit relied on most heavily, which was Casey for this point, um, you see that that is an actual instance where speech wasn't being targeted up front because what you had there Absent the physician getting informed consent, the physician would be uh, performing a battery, uh, you know, tort law that has regulated that because absent consent, any touching of a person is a battery. And so the speech wasn't at the center of that. It was actually the tort that was at the center of that. Uh, and so the law requiring the physician to get informed consent really wasn't requiring the physician to do speech first and foremost. It was requiring the physician not to do a battery. Thank you. We had a question in the Q&A section for you, Cody. In jurisdictions where the courts uphold prohibitions on conversion therapy, because the practice being forbidden is being regulated as conduct rather than speech, should we expect courts to uphold laws forbidding gender-affirming surgery? So I think that's a, a really good question. I want to break it down into two components. You know, one, I think gender affirming surgeries is more like Casey in the sense that what we are talking about there are medical procedures, that there's no speech involved there, that it is a concrete, abstract, or not, excuse me, you can't be concrete and abstract at the same time, a concrete medical procedure at issue. Um, what you know, the question may be getting at is, you know, gender affirming care in the counseling context. And I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander, that if a state can prohibit uh, conversations between client and counselor that seek to change uh, and bring someone's, uh, you know, someone's sexuality and someone's gender identity in harmony with their faith, then it's hard to understand why a state couldn't also prohibit counseling that does the opposite, that encourages a client to embrace same-sex attractions or embrace a, diff a gender identity different than their biological sex, um, because those conversations in the Ninth and Tenth Circuit are actually just conduct subject to rational basis. But in terms of the surgeries themselves, you know, that is different in the sense of there's no actual speech at issue in those cases. It's a, it's a medical procedure, just like in Casey. I'm sure some folks would make the argument that there is speech involved or perhaps freedom of expression. Uh, so what what do you think that that litigation would look like? Yeah, as I think that's where you actually do hit on what Casey is talking about when it upheld the informed consent. Um, the first step in the analysis has to be what are these laws targeting? And so states where gender affirming surgeries are prohibited, it's actually targeting the medical procedure itself. And so to the extent that expression and speech is swept into those, it actually is at the margin. You know, contrast that with these type of laws, these counseling restrictions, the heart of these restrictions is on what is being said in the counseling room. And so it's not, it's not targeting something concrete, it's targeting the actual words and conduct is swept in at the margin at best. And so I think those are two really good contrasts in when does the law actually target conduct and bring in speech incidentally versus when does it target speech? And if it brings in conduct at all, it's only at the margins. Does the outcome in Dobbs overruling Casey weaken the idea that this talk therapy is conduct or was that part of Casey not affected by Dobbs? 
So I think that that part of Casey survives Dobbs. Um, and in fact, I, I don't remember uh, explicitly, but I, I seem to recall there being something in one of the opinions in Dobbs that says, you know, we're not touching sort of the informed consent piece of Casey. We're just talking about the core constitutional right at issue here. So I, I think that that part of Casey survives Dobbs. But also, you know, I don't think it applies to these laws because these laws don't have conduct at their heart uh, in the way that a, an abortion, a concrete medical procedure is, like what was at issue in Casey. And just to take a step back, uh, will you explain to us where we are procedurally um, in Salazar? Are we, you mentioned something about on bonk review, certiorari, where, what has, do you think any circumstances have developed since then that will lead SCOTUS to grant a cert dispute? Yeah, so right now, um, the 10th Circuit ruled in about mid-September, so we are in the certiorari window right now. Um, and so hopefully the Supreme Court, once the petition is filed, will grant. Uh, the, the Fifth Circuit, actually, in a few weeks after Charles was decided, dropped a case in a different context, so not in counseling, but in a where do we draw the conduct and speech line in the professional setting. Um, it, the case was about a pet veterinarian. The Texas has a law that says you can't give advice unless you examine the pet in person. This veterinarian gave advice over the phone and the Texas sort of pursued him and said, well, this is just part of your conduct, not speech. So the same issue, just in a different context. And they said that they were regulating conduct because they were regulating the profession of, of veterinary medicine. And the Fifth Circuit said, no, what you're really targeting here is his speech. That the only thing at issue here is what he said, um, it's nothing that he did here. And they dropped a footnote sort of throwing shade at the Tenth Circuit majority's opinion in Childs, saying, you know, we don't agree with that analysis. Um, we think it's dubious that a counseling conversation is conduct and not speech. And so I think it lends credence to the argument that you know, not only did the, the Tenth Circuit get it wrong, but they really are, in, are deepening a circuit split here. And so we're, we're hopeful that the Supreme Court recognizes that and grants cert to resolve this issue and sort of restore the balance that I think NIFLA sought to achieve in this context. Because I think that's something that also gets lost here is that NIFLA cited by name the cases that had upheld these very laws and it cited them for disapproval. And yet, you know, here we are post NIFLA with courts sort of still upholding these laws, um, not exactly in the same way, but with the same spirit. And to clarify that last question that I was reading from our Q and A's, um, the last part of that question is, do you think circumstances have developed that will lead SCOTUS to grant cert? despite it declining Tingley? Yeah, so I think that's also a good question. So in Tingley, there were three justices who would have taken the case. It just needs four for cert to be granted. And so I think the deepening of the split itself um, is a circumstance that should lend more credence to another justice signing on. But I also think just the changes on the world stage of how we are thinking about gender dysphoria and the right standards of care for it because I think, you know, I'm happy to talk legal doctrine all day, but sometimes what gets lost is the real world consequences of these these counseling restrictions. You know, the United Kingdom issued a report where it commissioned someone to determine, you know, what is the best standard of care for people suffering with gender dysphoria? And the report essentially said that, you know, right now the way of going about it is based on weak to no evidence. And that there is a growing need for people who don't want to um, sort of transition away from their biological sex to receive counseling. And so at the end of the day, the report recommended more counseling services. And yet you have at least 25 jurisdictions at the state level, let alone municipalities, that prohibit the very counseling that the United Kingdom says is desperately needed. And so in the Ninth and Tenth Circuit right now, you have untold numbers of people who can't go to a counselor and get the type of counseling that they want for the issue that they need most, which is bringing their body in harmony 
with their convictions and is what the world is now recognizing as the one of the best standards of care. So I think those developments in the last year have really been explosive and have really showed the need to not only just treat this as speech, but just allow this type of counseling for the people who desperately need it. Now, taking a step back, thinking about the protection of speech more generally, when, and this is from our audience as well, when it comes to the amount of protection speech receives, does it make a difference whether the counselor or speaker is privately employed versus publicly employed, uh, as in the employer receives government funding or is a government entity? So, you know, there are lines of cases from the Supreme Court that talk about when does a publicly when does a public employee speak on their own behalf versus when are they speaking on behalf of the government? The government obviously has more latitude if government speech is an issue um, under current Supreme Court doctrine. But so far, all these cases have been brought by private individuals who are in private practice um, and are challenging. So that line of cases um, won't be implicated in any of the current challenges to these type of of counseling restrictions. And in this case, the plaintiff was employed privately, correct? Correct. correct. How does, and again, this is from our audience here, how does Oregon v. Smith or its possible overruling impact this case, if you're familiar with that case? Yeah, so um, Department of Late, um, Department of Human Services v. Smith, you know, obviously says that the free exercise clause isn't implicated if the law is neutral and generally applicable. Um, and that has been sort of the gatekeeper for these laws being considered under the free exercise clause that you because there's no religious language in these laws, then courts are evaluating, are they neutral and do they apply generally? And that's really where um the free exercise angle of this case has struggled to gain purchase with courts. They Courts will say, well, anyone can seek this counseling. Anyone can give this counseling. So it's generally applicable. There's nothing on its face that is targeting religion. It may have a disparate impact on the religious, but that doesn't matter for the free exercise analysis. And so I think Smith has stymied sort of development on the free exercise question here. I think if the court were to overrule it, I mean, the question is, well, what comes next? in terms of what the implication would be, you know, if the court does what it's doing in its second amendment context, which is look at history and tradition to determine sort of the contours of the free exercise clause, I think that would go a long way um, toward elevating the free exercise component of this case. And this was really the subject too of Judge Bumate's dissental in Tingley when the Ninth Circuit did not rehear Tingley on Bach. He said, not only are we dealing with speech, but we are dealing with religious speech, which the Supreme Court in Kennedy said ought to get double protection. Uh, but Smith is kind of neutering that aspect of this case. And so I think if the court were to go more along the lines of, you know, what have we historically done? Um, you know, these type of conversations have not been restricted historically. Uh, and so I, I do think that the, a, a post-Smith world might be friendlier to the free exercise part of this case. But right now, Smith is sort of the gatekeeper preventing the free exercise clause argument from getting off the ground. Speaking of the free exercise issue in this case, you mentioned this a bit earlier. A statute that prohibits conversion therapy is very, very likely to affect particular religions more than others. And it's possible that the law was intended to do so. So with a statue like this, how can you ever show that the object was religion? Yeah, and I think it's very difficult to do in a Smith world. I think this is another way that Smith sort of impacts it, because if the legislature is halfway competent and they don't put religious terms in the statute, then you are forced to try to smoke out the legislature's true motives here. And you know, I think one way to do that, according to the Lukumi case, is by looking at the real world object. You know, how is this law actually functioning in the real world? Yes, we can come up with hypotheticals, but what is the law really restricting? And that has been the angle that these cases have taken, but it's not been something that the courts have really bitten on. Um, they have kind of insisted that, well, anyone can get this counseling. We don't see any evidence of religious targeting here. 
uh, this is just targeting at what the state thinks is an ineffective mode of counseling. You know, under that line of reasoning, it's going to be very, very difficult for a law that is cloaked in, in facially neutral terms to really get off the ground when everyone knows that what is being targeted is religious speech, is a religious practice. You know, you can imagine, for instance, a law that prohibits steeples. Well, nothing on the face of that law targets religion. But we all know that a law that prohibits steeples is overwhelmingly disproportionately going to fall on religious folks who have church buildings with steeples. And yet under the logic of the Ninth and Tenth Circuit, because any building could have a steeple and because the government is just concerned with architectural matters, no harm, no foul. And so it really incentivizes the government to be crafty in how it goes about suppressing religion, which is uh, dangerous for our constitutional order. Taking a step back here, what are the practical implications of this 10th Circuit decision? And um, for those working in the space, what are some things that we need to be thinking about as this issue um, is, is decided or as you're going through the SCOTUS process? Yeah, so I think, you know, for First Amendment litigators and thinkers broadly, um, it really blurs the line of, well, how do we determine whether something is speech or whether it's conduct? It seems to be taking us back to a pre-NIFLA world where the professional context really does matter. Uh, you know, I think NIFLA sought to say, no, the rights of a professional under the First Amendment don't change just because they get a license. And yet, in both the Ninth Circuit's Tingley opinion and now in the Tenth Circuit's Child's opinion, the justifications kept falling back on this person has a license, they're trained, we expect certain levels of competency from them. So I think if, if you are a litigator representing a professional, it's going to be difficult to say that even the very words of that professional are speech under these type of precedents. That, you know, if they're giving some kind of advice, if they are giving some kind of, you know, written communication, that the state very well could regulate not only that ontologically, but even to the point of saying what viewpoint is correct and which one is incorrect. Um, and you, you think of a lot of hot button issues that are sort of first note flashpoints right now, you know, education being one, uh, you know, the 11th Circuit, I thought, made this point very poignantly. You know, if you can just slap a label on what a professional does and say that's conduct and so therefore no First Amendment problems, teaching the, the art of teaching looks like conduct. And even though a teacher is speaking and is debating and is delivering materials in a college classroom, what's to stop a state from saying, you know, just like in Childs, well, we think that this teaching is ineffective, that teaching these subjects, that teaching these viewpoints are ineffective, so therefore you can't do it. And so I think it should be very concerning for any of us that represent professionals in the First Amendment context um, because it's going to make it very difficult um, um, without the Supreme Court, you know, again, affirming that the way we tell what a law is targeting is by looking at what it's actually hitting upon. Um, what areas of using the court's reasoning, uh, the, the 10th Circuit's reasoning, what areas of the practice of law do you think could be regulated? As lawyers, I think this is probably a question we're all thinking. We're professionals. Our profession is heavily regulated. What about our speech? Yeah, and so this is actually being litigated right now under this same sort of tug of war between is it speech, is it conduct? Uh, in the Second Circuit, I think it was last summer they heard an argument and haven't issued an opinion yet. Uh, this pro bono clinic, non-lawyers wanted to give certain legal services to clients. And it was all services that were speech-based, you know, tax advice, trust in estates type of issues. And the New York bar came after them. And so this is the unlicensed practice of law. You can't do this. And the district court actually said, no, all they're doing is, is speaking and that gets first amendment protection. And so the state bar appealed that, uh, and that's pending before the Second Circuit right now. And, you know, an argument we often run across in this setting when talking about counseling as well, legal profession, we can't commit fraud on our clients. But I think it's important to remember, too, talking about practical protections and the sky not falling if we treat speech as speech. You know, there are certain categories of words that have historically been unprotected. And the Supreme Court has been clear that that falls outside the scope of the First Amendment. 
fraud and obscenity being two of those. And so it's not like finding that a counselor's speech is speech is going to allow the worst of the lawyers to suddenly go out and be, you know, hucksters and fraudsters. There are, again, protections in the system designed to deal with that. And I think you can contrast what is going on in the Second Circuit, too, with challenges uh, generally to uh, what a lawyer does. Um, again, those are challenges to conduct. Those laws regulate conduct. And so don't receive the same type of First Amendment scrutiny. But anything that falls within what a lawyer says, um, I think that we should really take notice of that um, because that implicates our speech rights. And if the Supreme Court is being serious in NIFLA, just because we're lawyers doesn't mean we have less First Amendment protection. Uh, it protects our words just as much as it protects the layperson's words. Are we seeing more and more states rolling out restrictions on professionals? Is this becoming a more common? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, one example comes to mind in our post COVID world, we've seen a lot of states pass misinformation statutes that prohibits doctors from giving what the state calls misinformation to uh, patients and who determines what is misinformation? Well, the state does. And that is not only antithetical to the letter of the First Amendment, but certainly to the spirit of the First Amendment, where government censors were licensing people that they liked and not giving license to people they didn't like in 1780s and saying, you get to speak because you have a license because we like what you say, and you don't get to speak um, because we don't like what you say. Um, and in fact, we're seeing this in the foster care world where states will not allow people who want to foster children to foster children unless they agree with the state's ideology about fostering. And they're saying, look, this is just the regulation of conduct. These are professional parent, foster parents. Uh, and so th these cases have had, uh, in fact, they cited Tingley for that very proposition. This was in Oregon. So these cases have had ramifications beyond just the counseling context. You know, it's, it's affected the medical profession. It's affecting whether or not you can foster children. Um, and I think there are certainly going to be more ripple effects to come, especially at, just as a broader society. We debate what it means to be fake news, what it means to be misinformation, disinformation, and how we best go about remedying what we see as those kind of problems. In the foster care space, do you think it matters to the court's analysis whether that foster parent is getting compensated? So I don't, I'm not sure if it does, um, but if it does, you know, I'll say that it shouldn't. Um, you know, again, thinking about how the Supreme Court has approached the issue, if we're talking about speech, which by requiring foster parents to espouse a certain ideology, the state is compelling speech, it's compelling foster parents to say, we believe X, even if they don't believe X. And in 303 Creative, uh, just two terms ago, the Supreme Court said that just because someone gets paid for their speech doesn't make their speech any less protected. So even if a foster parent is getting compensated by the state, that doesn't lessen the degree of protection that the First Amendment affords them. Certainly. I tend to wonder if it will become an issue as we're seeing this conduct versus speech in the professional space becoming more of an issue uh, with, I think in the common sense, we tend to think of professionals as they're working a job. They're getting paid. They're a healthcare provider. They're a doctor. They're a lawyer. They're a professional. When it comes to foster parents, that probably depends on the jurisdiction, and perhaps we'll see that issue come up. Right, and you know, I, I do think it is certainly a stretch for the state to say that there is such a thing as professional foster parenting and to justify its restriction on those grounds. But I think the principles are the same, even if that holds true. That even if there is such a thing as professional that I think the Supreme Court meant what it said in NIFLA, that, you know, whether it does not matter whether you are a professional or not, if what you are doing is engaging in speech, you get the full panoply of free speech rights. When it comes to counseling restrictions, like in this case here at the Tenth Circuit, have any serious arguments been made that these counseling restrictions survive strict scrutiny? So, you know, the Eleventh Circuit dealt with this more just because it did find that these laws target speech and not conduct. And so it walked through, I think, what are usually the state's arguments? You know, number one, the state advances as, as its interest things like protecting children, things like, you know, in regulating the integrity of the counseling profession. And you know, what we're finding is that there's just no evidence that 
what is at issue in this case, which is voluntary conversations between a counselor and a client who is setting the goals. Um, that there is the type of harm to the state is saying comes from this counseling has ever been demonstrated. In fact, that was a question that was asked of Colorado at the oral argument in Childs. And rather than point to any evidence that showed the type of harms, Colorado said, well, it would be unethical to gather this type of evidence, which creates a nice topology for the state to satisfy strict scrutiny. Well, these harms exist. Well, where's the evidence for these harms? Well, we can't test it. You know, you just have to trust us. And so it, it, there are, there are none, in my opinion, uh, of the arguments that are being advanced that actually show that the type of harms the state say come from this type of counseling really exist. The, the evidence the states generally point to are from aversive techniques, uh, things that happened in the 1960s and 1970s that were not speech-based, but were conduct-based, uh, things that were not voluntary, things that weren't even done by licensed professionals. Uh, so I think if we ever get past the speech fee conduct line, I think it's going to be very difficult for the state to meet strict scrutiny just because they've, they haven't been producing evidence in these cases that tailors uh, the harm to the actual counseling that's being done, which is voluntary conversations, you know, words only from clients who really want them uh, and consent to receiving them. Thank you. And looking at the clock here, we have just a few minutes left. So if there are any lingering questions, please send them in now. Otherwise, I'll give Cody an opportunity to cover anything he would like to speak more about. Um, we do have one question for you, Cody. Understanding that licensing has not been held to be determinative of whether freedom of speech is implicated, is it true that the state could forbid non-licensed individuals from discussing mental health for money in these states? So that is a trickier question. Um, Likely, yes, uh, under current doctrine. So licensing schemes in general have survived pretty ubiquitous challenges under the First Amendment because what courts have tended to say in that setting is what's being regulated is not your speech. What's being regulated is who can be a lawyer, who can be a mental health professional. Um, that being said, unless the state enacts a law that said similar to in law, you can't practice mental health unless you have a license. You know, I think we could see a situation like what you're seeing in New York um, with pro bono clinics offering speech related services and you know, the state saying, whoa, 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 you know, we're trying to regulate who says that. And the state, you know, trying to say that's just conduct and that actually starting to receive some pushback. So I, I think it really will, will break down on, is this a question of getting a license versus is the state just using the licensure as an excuse to stop what it is that you are saying? Because I think if it's the former, I think that's going to be a more of an uphill battle to fight in the courts because courts are generally reluctant to strike down licensing laws in general. But if it's a licensing law and sort of a, you know, unlicensed practice type of scheme, I think that might have more purchase. Uh, you know, we'll see what the Second Circuit does in the Upsolve case out of New York. But I, I do think that that, um, that would be the fault line in that case. Is, is it just a challenge to licensing generally or a challenge to I'm being cited for the unlicensed practice of counseling? Um, but you can't do that to me because I'm just speaking. Thank you. And thank you very much, Cody, for speaking with us today. And thank you all for your excellent questions and engagement with us. Um, we'll wrap up here. And thank you again to the Federalist Society for hosting this program. We hope to see you all in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.